Hello, and welcome back to the nephrology curriculum. Today, we're going to be talking about nephrolithiasis, or stones. So let's start out with a clinical case. A 44-year-old gentleman is seen in the emergency department for acute onset left-sided flank pain of two hours duration. He rates the pain 10 out of 10, and he can't sit still because of extreme discomfort from the pain. Hit and eyes fevers, chills. He's had some nausea in association with the pain, but no diarrhea or other systemic symptoms. He does note taking high-dose vitamin C supplements to prevent colds. And he drinks several glasses of iced tea daily, given that he's working outside in the heat as a construction manager for several hours out of the day. On physical exam, it's notable for left CVA or costal vertebral angle tenderness to percussion. His labs show normal electrolytes, and his urine analysis shows greater than 40 red blood cells per high power field. So the question is, what is our next step to diagnosing this gentleman? Let's go back through our clinical history and see if we've got some clues. So he's complaining of acute onset of colicky pain. That's very suggestive of a ureteral stone. Interestingly, he's also taking very high dose vitamin C and iced tea, both predispose patients to oxalate based stones. Working outside in the heat is also going to predispose to stone formation due to dehydration. And CBA tenderness, along with hematuria, very suggestive of stone. So our next step, we want to image the patient and see if, in fact, he does have a stone. So that's exactly what we do. We obtain a CT non-contrast of the abdomen and pelvis, and that's what's shown here in this particular image. This is an axial section taken right through the kidneys, and you can see that arrow is pointing in the left kidney to a bright hyperdensity that in fact, is a stone. So the question is, what is the etiology of this patient's presentation? It's a stone. So this patient has nephrolithiasis. So let's talk a little bit more about stones. Stones are common in industrialized nations. The lifetime risk of forming stones varies between men and women. So about 13% in men and 5% in women. The incidence is about one per 1,000 persons per annum. And the peak incidence typically occurs in the third and fourth decade of life and increases with age until about 60 to 70 years. The US prevalence has increased in stones from 3.2% in the late 1970s to about 8.8% in the first decade of the 2000s. And that increase in prevalence really moves from the north to the south, so it may have something to do with the hotter climate. White populations are greater in terms of stone formation than non-whites. Stone types can also vary depending on geographic location. For example, in the Mediterranean or Middle East, we typically will manifest with uric acid stones. In the United States, calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate are most common. In the United Kingdom, magnesium ammonium phosphate or struvite stones are most common. And then there's cysteine stones, which are actually quite rare. If we look at the distribution by stone type, you can see in this pie chart that clearly calcium-based stones are the highest. So typically calcium oxalate and calcium phosphate make up 37% of all stones. The next is calcium oxalate, making up 26% of stones, and then followed by struvite stones, making up about 22% of stones. Then finally, we have calcium phosphate at 7%, uric acid at 5%, and then cysteine only at 2%. So how do kidney stones form? It occurs when soluble material supersaturates in the urine. So let's go through that a little bit more closely. Free ion activities of a stone components are gonna be affected by the following. The crystal component concentration, presence of inhibitors in the urine, these are things like citrate, which chelates calcium, and the urinary pH. High urinary pH may precipitate certain stone types, while low urinary pH precipitates others. The level of chemical free ion activity where stones will neither grow nor dissolve is referred to as the equilibrium solubility product. Urine becomes supersaturated above that level, and when that happens, any stone present is going to grow in size. How exactly does that happen? Ions join together to form a stable solid phase, and when homogenous, 
that results in crystals or crystal urea. Calcium oxalate crystals attach to something called Randall's plaques. These are plaques or areas of calcium phosphate deposits in the renal papillae, shown here in the image on the right. When they do that, it promotes stone growth. And finally, we have genetic polymorphisms that are associated with stone farmers. These are genes that code for proteins that regulate tubular calcium and phosphate reabsorption, proteins that prevent calcium salt precipitation, or aquaporins in the proximal tubule. 